When the Warren report was issued, it was hailed generally by newspapers around the country as a fine document, one which answered every question, one which resolved every doubt. However, the report was nothing more, purported to be nothing more, than an adequate summation, a fair summation, of some 26 volumes of testimony and exhibits which had not yet been published. The New York Times had said editorially that the report answered the questions, but it could not say that it was a good or fair document as it did because the Times had not had an opportunity to look at the evidence which had not yet been published. Then the evidence was published. Anthony Lewis wrote in a front page headline story the day the 26 volumes were released. He had had those 26 volumes in his possession for less than three hours. And he wrote, the evidence in the 26 volumes supports conclusively the commission's statement that Oswald, one lone unhappy man, was the assassin. Now, given the fact that Mr. Lewis reads more rapidly than I do, it took me a year and a half to read the material in the 26 volumes. And I wonder how Mr. Lewis was able to digest it all in three hours and assure the American people that it all said precisely what the commission stated in its report. One of the crucial questions in the case is the question of whether or not one bullet did what the commission said it did. Because the rifle is not able to fire as rapidly as the commission uh, perhaps would like it to in order to accomplish all of the things which resulted that day, the commission was forced to conclude that one bullet entered the president's neck, back of the neck, exited from his throat, went on to strike Governor Connolly, go through the governor's back, shatter his fifth rib, shatter his right wrist, and end up in his left thigh. And it was later recovered on a stretcher in Dallas, and it is known as Commission Exhibit 3, a pure pristine bullet, which has less than three grains of metal missing from it, while Governor Connolly still has more than three grains of metal in his right wrist, and many more grains than that in his fifth rib, which was shattered by the, by the bullet. Nevertheless, the commission says this one bullet left behind more grains of metal, evidently, than it possessed. But the whole commission case turns on this question because all of the shots were fired in less than six seconds. This rifle requires a minimum period of 2.3 seconds in order to reload and aim at being an ancient bolt-operated, uh, hand-operated weapon. If four shots were fired, if four shots were fired, then three interval periods are required. Three interval periods means 2.3 seconds times three. It's almost seven seconds just for the interval periods. And it was all accomplished in about in 5.8 seconds. So if four shots were fired, we know that neither Oswald nor anyone else was a lone assassin with this weapon. But then we come to a, another remarkable aspect of this. The doctor who treated Governor Connolly came out of the room at 4.30. Now, we must remember Commission Exhibit 399, the only link between the Manlika Carcano and the assassination discovered on a stretcher somewhere in Dallas, was discovered at 2 o'clock on November 22nd. Well, we went down to Dallas and looked at all the footage, listened to all of the tapes, and heard Dr. Shaw coming out of the room at 4.30, describing the governor's wounds, two and a half hours now after a bullet has been discovered. And he starts to describe the wounds, and he says the governor will survive, and it's not too serious, his wrist is fractured, the wound in the chest, etc. And then, and then the, the film is cut, right in the middle of the sentence. It's cut because the rest was taken by the government. We never knew what that was. But recently, we did a three-hour television special for Channel 5 here, in, uh, inviting us to do that. Channel 5 said, if you'd like, you can look at all of our footage. We said, we'd like very much to do that. They had received some stuff from Dallas very quickly. And of course, the FBI didn't go all over the country and try to get copies of everything. That would probably have been impossible. But I think they probably presumed that most of the material in Dallas had not been very widely spread at that time, since they moved in rather early. But Channel 5 here, WNEW-TV, did have some of that WFAA-TV material. And there we heard the end of what Dr. Shaw said for the first time. This was just a month or so ago. For the first time, we heard Dr. Shaw complete the sentence, which the FBI sees and which the government has, but no one was permitted to have. 
and he said, and the bullet which did all of the damage is in Governor Connolly's left thigh at the present time. It has not yet been removed, but don't be alarmed. It is there, we've seen it. We will remove it shortly. That is not a major problem. Two and a half hours after Commission Exhibit 399 was recovered in Dallas, the bullet which did all of the damage and which fell out of Governor Connolly's thigh, according to the Commission. Two and a half hours later, Dr. Shaw said the bullet remained in Governor Connolly's thigh. And it's for that reason, of course, that the FBI seized the film and has made it unavailable. Commander Humes conducted the autopsy on the president's body on November 22nd at the Bethesda, Maryland Naval Hospital. And he made notes when he examined the body. And he drafted an autopsy. If you'd like to know what was in that original autopsy, I commend your attention to volume 17, page 45 of the evidence, in which you will find this certificate. This is to certify that I, Commander J.J. Humes, have destroyed by burning my original draft autopsy notes. That takes care of the notes. Actually, they were not his notes. Those were our notes that Commander Humes burned. He was given the responsibility of conducting the autopsy for the American people. And he's a commander in the Navy. And the notes which he took are historic documents and belong to all of us. I would like to know why he burned them. Commander Humes testified that it is almost required in cases of violent death inflicted by a missile which moves through a body in order to determine whether the direction that the bullet moved, that photographs of the body be taken, and that x-rays of the body be taken. And at the request of Commander Humes and his direction, photographs and x-rays of the president's body were taken on November 22nd at Bethesda Hospital, ostensibly to assist Commander Humes in his determination of the path of the missiles as they coursed through the president's body. However, Dr. Humes testified that he was never permitted to see the photographs which were taken to assist him, that before they were developed, they were removed from the autopsy room by agents of the United States Secret Service. As far as the x-rays are concerned, no member of the Warren Commission, no lawyer for the Warren Commission, ever saw the x-rays or the photographs, the most invaluable documents in this case, in resolving the classic question, where did the shots come from? This did not interfere with the commission at all, though, because when they called Commander Humes, they asked if he had anything to show uh, regarding the nature of the wounds. He said, oh, yes. Gentlemen, I thought that you might be unable to get the photographs and the x-rays. This is a commander of the Navy talking to a commission appointed by the President of the United States, which is given broad and unlimited subpoena powers, which could get any document it wanted anywhere in the United States. He said, therefore, I ask an artist to sketch so that you might be better acquainted. And the lawyer said, and are these drawings accurate to your best knowledge? And he said, no. <laughs> said they can only be accurate if the artist was allowed to see the photographs, but he couldn't see the photographs. So it was just my recollection transmitted to him verbally, which resulted in the sketches. The commission having determined that the evidence offered to it was inaccurate, solemnly admitted it in evidence, of course. And all you can see in the 26 volumes regarding the wounds, anything which depicts them, are three photographs, rather crudely drawn, long after the event by an artist who never saw the photographs or the x-rays and relied upon a verbal description given by the commander. And this is the state of the record. Now, it is not that the commission was unconcerned about carrying out its investigation. Two of the lawyers were indicating that they were sort of rushed and they couldn't do all the important things they had to do. Mr. D'Antonio spoke about Charles Brem, and I think you saw Mr. Brem. And uh, as you know, he wasn't called. He was only the closest spectator to the limousine when the shots were fired. He saw a bullet, the result of the bullet which struck the president's head, which drove a portion of the skull backward onto the street, where in fact it was recovered by a Dallas Deputy Constable Seymour Weitzman, eight to 12 inches from the south side of the Elm Street curb, as he testified. Mr. Brim was on television on November 22nd. He was not a secret witness. That's how we knew about him. But he was never called by the commission. Perhaps in its rush, it didn't have time to call the closest spectator to the limousine. But who did the commission call instead, for example? It called Professor Revelo Oliver, 
a distinguished uh, gentleman who has recently resigned from the Birch Society, I think charging that it is too liberal an organization. <laughs> Professor Oliver wrote an article in the American Opinion publication related to the Birch Society. He was in Illinois when the shots were fired in Dallas, Professor Oliver, and his article, of course, had nothing whatever to do with what happened in Dallas with any evidence he had to offer. The commission devoted more than 100 pages to the grantings of Professor Oliver in its 26 volumes. And then that was not enough. The commission solemnly called Professor Oliver to testify as one of its witnesses. And hour after hour, Mr. Jenner, one of the distinguished commission lawyers, questioned Professor Oliver to discuss and explore with him his theories. But there is much other relevant information in the report, which we should bear in mind when we hear that the commission lawyers were too rushed to turn out an exact document and were not able to call the relevant witnesses. For example, should you be interested in the condition of Jack Ruby's mother's teeth in, in the year 1937, you need merely return to the page in the documents which publishes her full dental chart, which I suggest would not even been, be relevant if it was charged that Ruby bit Oswald to death. And should you like to know how the commission felt about Jack Ruby's mother's, I quote, fishbone delusion, that is her feeling over a period of some 17 years that something was stuck in her throat, which she thought was a fishbone, the commission devoted a third of a page of its report to a discussion of Jack Ruby's mother's fishbone delusion. And it was this which so occupied the commission that it was an, uh, unable to call more than 1% of the witnesses to the assassination. It was unable to call the most important witnesses to the murder of Officer Tippett. And now we turn to a report submitted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation to the Commission. This is what two agents of the FBI, Siebert and O'Neill, reported. They were present at the autopsy, reported that there was no wound in the president's neck. There was, in fact, a wound in the president's back. And this is what the agents say about what they observed. During the latter stages of the autopsy, Dr. Humes located an opening which appeared to be a bullet hole, which was below the shoulders, then uh, it was not high in the neck, and two inches to the right of the middle line. The doctor probed and further probing determined that the distance traveled by this missile was a short distance inasmuch as the end of the opening could be felt with the finger, inasmuch as no complete bullet of any size could be located in the back or any other area of the body, and inspection revealing that there was no point of exit, so it didn't go in and come out, no point of exit. The individuals performing the autopsy were at a loss to explain why they could find no bullets. After the doctors, I'll abbreviate it because it's a long report, but after the doctors were informed that there was cardiac massage done to the president at the Parkland Hospital, they concluded. Immediately following receipt of this information, this was made available to Dr. Humes. Dr. Humes stated that the pattern was clear, that the one bullet had entered the president's back and had worked its way out of the body during external cardiac massage. That was the position on November 27th. But after the commission members looked at the Zapruder film, and there it is seen, Governor Conley reacts 1.8 seconds to being struck by the bullet after President Kennedy reacts, 1.8 seconds. This rifle couldn't fire twice in that period of time. And that's when the commission realized that a new theory had to be born, one explaining that the governor and the president were hit by the same bullet. Well, the first problem is, what do you do with the hole in the back? Well, you burn Dr. Humes' original notes. You suppress the x-rays and the photographs. And then all you have left is the final testimony of Dr. Humes. 
and you suppress the FBI report. You don't publish the report because that tells there was a wound in the back which had no point of exit. The bullet only went in a short distance and the bullet fell out. So you have to suppress all of that material. Well, the commission did that. This document, I think, which was just recently declassified, was declassified, I believe, in error. I mean, I think they made a serious error about this, not only because it's so contrary to their case, but I think the mechanics of how it was uncovered indicates it's an error. This is, I believe, Commission Exhibit 7 of those 1,555. It has an X in front of it. All those documents which, with Xs in front of them are documents which are not available, which are classified. And the researcher who went down there meant to order document 17, which is not classified. But he made a careless 17. And the archivist who was working there that day, the assistant archivist, thought it was seven, and for some reason did not notice, I imagine, that there was an X in front of it, and then gave him this document, which we now have. But in any event, it is completely contrary, completely contrary to what the commission said took place. And so by suppressing the evidence, by classifying the evidence, by hiding the x-rays and the photographs, burning the original notes, you can be left with the theory. Well, then we're next left with the next question. Why did Governor Connolly react 1.8 seconds after the president, they were both hit by the same bullet? Ah, uh, said the commission. Governor Connolly was struck merely a glancing blow, a glancing blow. But Dr. Shaw described it as a bullet which entered his back, shattered his fifth rib, caused the entire fifth rib to become secondary missiles, which then spread out through the body, cause, causing a large sucking wound. And uh, one of the lawyers said, well, would Governor Connolly have noticed that right away? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shaw advised uh, the lawyer that in his opinion, he would have noticed it and would have reacted to it at once. And then we have the testimony of Governor Connolly. There is no way to reconcile Governor Connolly's testimony and Mrs. Connolly's testimony with the commission's conclusion that the same bullet which hit the president hit the governor. This is what Governor Connolly said. I heard the first shot, and later I was struck. Now, Mrs. Connolly, seated alongside of him, said precisely the same thing, except she was able to observe both the president and the governor. She said, I heard the first shot. I looked at the president, his hands, then went to his throat. And uh, she continued, John, her husband, John Connolly, turned to his right to look at the president, couldn't see him, started to turn to the left, and then he was hit. So Mrs. Connolly is wrong. Governor Connolly is wrong. The films taken by Abraham Zapruder, they're wrong. The x-rays and photographs are gone. The original autopsy report is burned, and the FBI report is classified. And that's the way the commission operated to prove that one bullet hit both men. The motion picture film taken by Abraham Zapruder was published by the commission and the frames are all numbered. And it is through the system that the commission fixed various things that took place that day. The commission, however, omitted to publish frames 208, 29, 210, and 211. This is, in fact, one of the pages of the Warren Commission report, which shows frame 207, and the next one underneath it is frame 212. Frame 212 has been spliced. There are two other frames put together to make up what the commission calls frame 212. When one of our investigators on the West Coast, who is an engineering graduate student, discovered this, he raised this with a number of engineering uh, faculty members and physicists and others in universities on the West Coast and asked them what could there possibly be in the picture which could have led to the decision by someone in government to remove those frames from the public documents. Obviously, the bullet moves too quickly to be photographed, so a bullet is not the answer. Secondly, a person could not really react quickly enough to seeing or hearing something in 4 18ths of a second, so it could not be the reaction of a human being in all probability that was suppressed when the commission omitted those frames. And when one examines frame 212, one sees the sign 
large sign, probably about five feet long, which blocks a portion of the film. We don't know what is in frame 28, 29, 10 or 11, but we do know what is in frame 212. By the time you reached frame 212, Mr. Zapruder, who was moving his camera to follow the limousine, had moved his camera so that the left portion of the sign, left bottom portion, is no longer visible. So what has been removed in the frames, clearly, are those frames which show the entire sign. This is relevant because, as one of the commission attorneys has now agreed, if one can show that a bullet hit that sign, then the commission's theory that Oswald was the lone assassin receives another independent fatal blow because the commission's conclusion as to when the president was hit before that would not allow time for anyone using this ancient 1898 relic, which sells for $3 if you buy them in lots of 25 or more, to have operated the bolt and fired. In fact, in the hands of the fastest rifleman the government could find, it took him 2.3 seconds to operate the bolt and fire the next shot. And the president was hit less than a second before these frames were taken. So if a bullet hit that sign, the theory that Oswald or anyone else was the lone assassin with a weapon like this one is forever gone. What you can see in frame 212, while you cannot see the bottom left-hand portion of the sign, are lines of strain across the sign, very clear lines, indicating that the sign is reacting to something which has struck it. And when you look at frame 213 and 214, you see the lines grow longer and longer. And the engineering and physics experts, photographic experts who have examined the sign, say that it appears that a bullet struck the sign in the lower left-hand portion, and the lines of strain can be seen on the succeeding frames. But the hole, of course, is not visible because that portion of the lower left-hand portion where the bullet hole might be, if it is there, has been omitted by the commission in its publication. This was raised with Mr. Wesley Liebler, one of the attorneys for the commission, not long ago. Mr. Liebler presented this theory, which had been presented to him in a letter to Mr. Rankin, who was general counsel of the commission, and said, in my view, it is plausible that a bullet did hit the sign. And he said, I have no knowledge that any member of the commission or lawyer for the commission was ever told that the frames had been spliced and that frames had been omitted. And he then called for a new investigation and for an open, a formal request to the Federal Bureau of Investigation as to why that frame was spliced and what is in those missing frames. Mr. Rankin wrote back and suggested that Mr. Liebler, who is now teaching at West Coast University, pay more attention to his studies out there and indicated that the case is closed. Now we have more frames from the Sapruta film which we should give consideration to. Frame 313 is the frame which shows the president's head as he is struck by the bullet. That's the fatal shot. Now, how the president reacted, how his body moved as the bullet hit him, of course, is most relevant. If he was driven backward, then he was shot from the front. If he was driven forward, he was shot from the back. These are rules of physics which applied even in Dallas on that day. But the commission sought to make use, evidently, of these rules in a most perverse way. The commission published all of the frames, including after the bullet struck the president's head, 313, 314, and 315, and other frames. If you look at these frames, as the commission published it, it appears that after the president had been hit, 315 and 314 show the president moving forward, indicating that he was hit from the rear. But one of these brilliant young men in America who are concerned about who killed their president made a thorough examination of the photographs over a period of almost a year and was able to prove, conclusively prove, that the commission published the frames 314 and 315 in reverse order and mislabeled them. Thus, one examining frames 314 and 315 would think the president 
was driven forward by the bullet which hit from the rear, but since they have been transposed, it shows quite clearly the president was driven back up against the seat. He discovered this by analyzing the, the frames, and I won't bore you with the details, but I will read to you a letter from J. Edgar Hoover, which Mr. Hoover wrote to this gentleman who pointed out that the frames were transposed. This is from Mr. Hoover. You are on the stationery of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. You are correct in the observation that frames labeled 314 and 315 of Commission Exhibit 885 are transposed in volume 18, as noted in your letter. Mr. Hoover added that the National Archives is aware of this print printing error. However, I do appreciate your interest in this matter. <laughs> The commission said at the outset that it was going to scrutinize the FBI, the Secret Service, and the Dallas police, and it was going to rely upon those agencies for its information. It's a very difficult problem to resolve, I think. The commission resolved its dilemma in favor of total reliance and no scrutiny whatsoever. But these are facts which we cannot avoid. The president's life was delivered into the hands of the Secret Service, the FBI, and the Dallas police in Dallas on November 22nd, and the president was killed while in the protection and under the protection of those agencies. And the alleged assassin of the president was shot to death while not only in the protection of the Dallas police, but in the basement of the Dallas police station, and while being protected by 70 Dallas police officers. And it's for this reason, when the doubts were so widely felt in this country that the commission indicated that it would scrutinize these agencies closely. But if you read the report, you can see the commission relied upon and did not scrutinize the agencies whatsoever. And the role of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in this case is indeed a role which is scandalous. And if nothing more were done by the FBI of a negative nature, other than that which it did in this case, there would be sound grounds to call for the resignation of Mr. Hoover. <laughs> and the dissolution of that corrupt agency. The fact is this, the majority of the witnesses who were questioned by the FBI, who then testified before the commission, who were confronted with FBI statements of what they purportedly told the agents of the FBI. In the majority of cases, the witness said, the report is wrong. I did not say that. And there is a pattern which runs through what the FBI said the witness said, when the witness claims he did not say it. Wherever the reply, according to the witness, it was changed so that the testimony in the report was consistent with Oswald's guilt as the lone assassin, while what the witness said was inconsistent with that conclusion. And we take one example of Nelson Delgado, who was a rifleman, who was in the Marine Corps with Oswald and on the rifle range with Oswald. He said he saw him practice, he saw him fire for score. He said Oswald was a lousy shot. There's just no other way to put it. He was a lousy shot. And he was sort of the laughing stock of the outfit because of this. He said, I told this to the agents of the FBI. And then this is his testimony. He said, but they did not want to accept that. They argued with me. They badgered me. They sought to have me change my statement. Now we have a, a charge by a man who was, even, who was in the army at the time that he testified before the commission, now in Vietnam, as a matter of fact. He said, the FBI sought to have me change my statement. Now we have a charge that agents, four agents, whose names he gave to the commission, were involved in attempting to suborn perjury. It's a very serious charge and the integrity of any investigation, which rests to a large extent upon what the FBI agents did, must be tested by how the commission reacted to the serious charge before it. Did it call the four agents? Did it ask for their side of the story? Did it conduct an investigation? It did none of these things. It never commented for a moment upon this serious charge made by Mr. Delgado and by other witnesses who testified before the commission about similar experiences. 
So the commission relied upon the FBI, and the FBI agents were going out there trying to badger witnesses to change their story, which would fit more conveniently into the FBI conclusion and the commission's ultimate conclusion and the one from which it started. Well, on the question of Oswald's background, we see now if the commission acquitted itself of its responsibility there. This is Commission Exhibit 917, published by the commission in the volumes. And I read it to you. It is a cable from the American Embassy in Moscow of November 3rd, 1959, which reads as follows. Concerning the renunciation of US citizenship and request for Soviet citizenship by Lee Harvey Oswald, former Marine and, and then 41 letters are deleted. Former Marine and, uh, what could be there? Star of stage, screen, and radio? <laughs> Well, I mean, let your mind wander. What could there be? Agent, or informant of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, what 41 letters appear to fit? And the cable goes on. Oswald stated he was radar operator in Marine Corps and offered to furnish Soviets information he possesses on US radar. That's what the government said Oswald did. If that was the government's position about what Oswald did, Oswald should have been arrested when he returned to the United States. But he was not went down to the Southwest and applied for a passport and received it in 24 hours. When I applied for my passport, it was given to me in the ordinary course of events, I believe. It took eight days. Oswald got his in 24 hours, despite the fact that a cable was sent to the very agency, the State Department, which issues the passports. On a recent radio broadcast with Mr. Jenner, who was the attorney who said on the program he was assigned to Oswald's background, Oswald's motive and the possibility of conspiracy and the possibility that Oswald was government connected in one way or another. I read this cablegram to Mr. Jenner, who was the senior counsel in this area, and asked him if he would be good enough to tell us now what those 41 letters are. Former Marine and what comes next? Mr. Jenner said, I don't know. And I said, but you were the man who was given the task of determining Oswald's background and motive, etc., and government connection. And this might, those 41 letters could conceivably show a government connection, could they not? He said, I have faith in whoever deleted those letters. <laughs> they knew what they were doing, I'm sure of that. I said, would you be good, good enough to share the basis of your faith with us? Would you tell us who made the deletions? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> well, at first we were asked to have faith in the Chief Justice and his colleagues. The fact is that who shot the president, where the photographs and the x-rays are, where the shots came from, how fast the rifle can operate, is it possible for anyone with this rifle to have fired as accurately as Oswald allegedly did? These are facts, and they are susceptible to proof. Why then are we asked to have faith? I think that the commission is asking too much of us. I think we have some rights to make some requests to the commission at this point. I think we have a right to know, for example, why a good portion of the reports submitted to the commission remain in the National Archives and have been sealed for 75 years by order of Lyndon B. Johnson. If Oswald is the lone assassin, then there is no question regarding national security in the archives. There can be nothing in the archives which implicates anyone else or any government agency or any foreign power, nothing like that can be involved because the commission said, after looking at the evidence, it concluded that Oswald was the lone assassin. Well, if that's what the evidence shows, why can't we see it? Now, in terms of the hard physical evidence, the rifle, the pistol, shot Officer Tippett, we're told, the bullets taken from Officer Tippett's body and allegedly, possibly related to Oswald's pistol, all of the other, the jacket Oswald allegedly discarded, all of the other physical evidence, that is not even in the National Archives. The Dallas police radio tapes showing what the broadcasts were on November 22nd, possibly showing why the Dallas police were looking for Oswald 15 minutes after the shots were fired when there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever which pointed toward Oswald at that time, though why they sent out Oswald's description. Well, none of this physical evidence is in the archives. It has been entrusted to the tender mercies of the Dallas police 
the FBI, the Secret Service, the CIA, and the other federal and local police agencies. And we have no commitment that even in the year 2039 that we will be able to examine that evidence, if it still exists. Of all of the extravagant statements made by the Commission, and it's difficult perhaps to single out one as, a, as the most extravagant, but if one was forced to, perhaps this would be it. The Commission had the rifle tested under conditions which simulated those which existed on November 22nd, said the Commission. Now we're going to see how they did. Oswald's last known score with a rifle in the Marine Corps showed that he fired 199 on, 9, 191 on the rifle range, one point above the minimum for qualification for the lowest rank in the Marine Corps, which, according to the Marine Corps expert who testifies, means that Oswald was, quote, a rather poor shot. And now we're going to see how we simulate the conditions. The Commission found the three best riflemen in America, all listed as masters by the National Rifle Association, gave them the rifle and told them to duplicate it. So that's the first thing, the qualification of the man with the weapon. Then we come to the second point. The second point is the quality of the ammunition. The Commission said, in the speculation and rumors section, that's where they put all of the facts about the assassination. <laughs> speculation and rumor. It has been said that the ammunition for the rifle was 20 years old and therefore would be of questionable reliability. Commission finding. The ammunition is currently being manufactured by the Olin Matheson Company, and the ammunition used by Oswald was recently made. Well, one of the investigators for the Citizens Committee here in New York very ingeniously did that, which the government and its $1 million investigation never thought of doing. He wrote a letter to Olin Matheson and said, when was the last time you manufactured ammunition for that rifle? And they wrote back and said, 1944, against the government contract. And the letter wrote and said, and therefore, any such ammunition would be of questionable reliability. Well, the commission took a shortcut. It merely said it is currently being manufactured. It was recently made, and therefore, there's no question about its reliability. Well, now we have old ammunition, and we have uh, used by Oswald. We don't know what the experts used or where they got their ammunition. And we have three expert riflemen. Now, Oswald was on the sixth floor when he fired, according to the commission. That's more than 60 feet above the ground. Well, in order to simulate the test, the experts were asked to fire from a perch 30 feet above the ground. Oswald was firing at a moving target, we're told. In order to simulate a moving target, the experts were asked to fire at three large stationary targets. But they complained about the rifle. Evidently, quite bitterly, the FBI expert who arranged the test and got the experts said that they, there was a lot of talk about the rifle by the experts. He said something about how the, the bolt was very hard to work scope, you know, was wobbling and poorly aligned and shot down and to the right. And the experts were reluctant to fire with such a terrible weapon, with such a poor scope, which wobbled. But the experts, whatever they said, were able to have, at the, at the commission's instruction, a gunsmith come in. And they had two metal shims attached to the scope and attached to the rifle in order to correct it and in order to keep it from wobbling. That's how you simulate conditions which existed on November 22nd. And now they fired. Oh, yes, the commission said, there's a tree which doesn't show up on that uh, picture. And it is in front of the book depository building. And the commission said that the president is seen reacting to the wound in his throat eight-tenths of a second after the limousine bearing the president first became visible to Oswald as it came from behind the tree. So of all the shots that Oswald fired that day, the first one was the one which required the greatest skill. Less than eight-tenths of one second for his first shot. And the experts were told, quote, take as much time as you want for your first shot. That's how you simulate that condition. And they fired at the stationary targets with the rebuilt weapon from an area half as high as Oswald, a perch half as high as Oswald was supposed to, with we don't know what kind of ammunition, but we know, do know it was with an improved weapon. Two of the three experts of the three best riflemen in America were unable to fire the rifle as quickly as Oswald did. They each tried the, the test twice. Three shots, each twice, six shots, each expert, three experts, 18 shots. The commission never said what the, where the bullet struck, never. But if you pick up the exhibits which show the targets, 
you see that not one of all 18 shots hit the head or neck portion of the target. Not one, even under those circumstances. What does the test show, according to the commission? This test, which simulated conditions which existed on November 22nd, proved that Oswald certainly had the capability to fire those two shots into the president's head on November 22nd. And to conclude on the question of uh, some photographs as we began, a photograph was taken by a man named Philip Willis, a retired Air Force major, five minutes after the shots were fired in Dealey Plaza. And he had in his photograph the front of the book depository building. And there standing in the right-hand portion of the photograph was a man who appeared to be Jack Ruby. In fact, agents of the FBI called upon Mr. Willis and said, you know, that you have, that's a valuable picture. It shows that Jack Ruby was at the assassination scene, or at least there five minutes after the shots were fired. And he said, yes, everybody says that's Jack Ruby. And they took all that picture and 11 others, all 12 pictures from him. Well. The peculiar thing about this is the commission published all 12 of Major Willis's photographs, just as they were taken, except this one. It just cropped off the man who looked like Jack Ruby and published it in that fa fashion. So we have the two photographs, the one taken by Major Willis with the man who appears to be Jack Ruby on it and the commission exhibit, which shows the man completely removed. And in that fashion, the commission was able to conclude, as it did, Ruby was not at the assassination scene ever on November 22nd, never in Dealey Plaza. Well, there's another photograph which is even more important, I suggest. It was taken by a lady named Mary Mormon. She was in front of the limousine and on this side, the south side of Elm Street, and she took a picture with a Polaroid land camera, and she said as she took a picture, she heard a shot. And in the background, and the president, which the first bullet was fired, in the background, she said she captured the whole book depository building. Now we have a picture of the book depository building at the time the shot was fired. Sounds like a valuable picture, but we can't rely upon Miss Mormon as to what was in the picture. We can rely, I think, perhaps upon the Dallas deputy sheriff who took the picture, picture from her, who filed a report published in the volumes in which he says, I have taken from Miss Mormon a photograph which she took of the limousine at the time the shots were fired, and it shows the sixth floor window from which the gunman allegedly fired the shots. He said, I've given the photograph to a Secret Service agent whose name he gave, and then if you rummage through the volumes, you see the statement from the Secret Service agent who says, I have taken the picture from the Dallas Deputy Sheriff, taken by Miss Mormon, and he describes it precisely as the, uh, the Deputy Sheriff did. It shows the window where the gunman allegedly sat when the shots were fired. Well, now we have come up with the most important single document in the case on the question of was Oswald there, was he there alone, was he firing with a rifle at the president? And where is that photograph? Did you see it on the front page of your daily newspaper or in the Warren Commission report? It is nowhere, never published, no reference to it in the entire Warren Commission report, and the only references in the 26 volumes are the two references which I just gave you. So there is a picture somewhere which shows the sixth floor window at the time that the shots were fired. And who does it show in the window, if anyone? But I suggest to you if that picture showed Oswald up there with his rifle firing out of the window, it would have been published as the cover of the Warren Commission report. And it would have been a basic document relied upon by the commission. And the, and the failure. <laughs> and the failure of the commission to publish that picture and to state that it used that picture in any way, I think is an indication that picture shows something completely contrary to the conclusions that the commission reached. This is a, another photograph. This is Life magazine, the source of factual data for many years in America. And on the cover is Lee Harvey Oswald. It says, Lee Oswald with the weapons he used to kill President Kennedy and Officer Tippett. This is the rifle he used to kill President Kennedy. You can see on it, pro probably not from there, but very clearly here, a telescopic sight present on the rifle. Marina Oswald said she never saw a rifle with a telescopic sight on it in her life until she saw one on television after the assassination. And it shows Oswald with a pistol in his pocket, on his, in a holster on his hip. Marina testified that she never saw Oswald with a pistol at any time in her life. Never. Yet the commission said she took this photograph. We noticed at the time, as photographers all over the world noticed at the time, 
that there is something on the face of the picture which appears to be an inconsistency and a discrepancy. You know the shadow, you probably can't see it unless you're up front, of Oswald's nose, it falls directly down in the middle of his mouth, goes neither to the right nor to the left. The sun was obviously just over his head when the picture was taken of his face. Where was it when the picture of the body was taken though? Shadow falls sharply to the right and to the rear. We raised this with the commission. Photographers all over the country examined this and said, unless the head was superimposed on this photo, there is only one other possibility, and that is that the picture was taken in a society which enjoys a dual solar system. <laughs> Well, the FBI and Secret Service agents testified that they remembered that when this picture was shown to Oswald, Oswald said, my head has been superimposed on that photograph. That is my head, but I never held a rifle. I never had a pistol, never posed in any way with a pic for a picture like that. Well, the commission thought this was a serious matter and therefore asked the FBI to take someone up to the roof of the FBI building have him pose with the rifle in the same stance and duplicate the shadows, I assume, in order to prove that this could be done. And they did take such a picture, and the commission published the picture of an FBI man on the roof of the building standing there with the rifle in the same stance. This is the photograph as published by the commission. <laughs> they have removed the head of the FBI agent. I wonder if it's too much to believe that if they were able to duplicate the, the shadows on this picture, if they would have left the head on. In any event, the FBI photography expert, Mr. Shaneyfeld, was asked, why did you blank out the head of the man? And Mr. Shaneyfeld said, first of all, nothing about the head was pertinent. <laughs> and secondly, he said, besides it was a secret agent being an FBI employee, <laughs> and we thought he should remain anonymous. Leaf through those volumes, those 26 volumes, and you will find many pictures of FBI agents posing for the reenactment of the rifle test, seated in the presidential mezzanine as they go through various reenactments and reconstructions. Their heads have not been removed, not at all. This was the only head of an FBI agent removed. And if one wants to do a capsule analysis of the commission and its report, in just a paragraph or so, I think it can be done by an examination of the Commission's conclusions relative to the attempt on General Walker's life. The Commission, of course, said Oswald did it. There was one witness only to any aspect of that event. His name is Walter Kirk Coleman, the young man who lived behind General Walker's house. He told the Dallas police and the FBI that he heard the shot fired. He ran out of the house and he saw two men run from behind, from the area where in which the shots had been fired. Two men, one had a rifle in his hand, which he threw onto the floorboard of the car and then jumped into the car and he drove off. The other man drove off in another car and in another direction. Now Oswald could not drive, the commission found, first of all. Secondly, when the FBI showed pictures of Oswald to Mr. Coleman, he said Oswald was neither of the two men. The commission never questioned Walter Kirk Coleman, the only witness to any aspect of the event, and stated instead that Oswald shot at General Walker, never questioning the only witness. I think that in our brief reading of General Walker's testimony, one would say that General Walker took a sounder position than did the commission. General Walker said, of course, I'm interested in knowing who shot at me in April of 63 because he might shoot at me again. I'd like to know who that is. And he therefore had his own investigation conducted, he said. And he said, and so far as I'm concerned, there's no evidence which shows that Oswald did it, and I do not believe that Oswald shot at me. He said, furthermore, in the absence of proof that Oswald did shoot at me, I must continue, being a good American citizen, to presume that Oswald was innocent. That's what General Walker said. That's not what Earl Warren said. I generally am asked any number of questions on radio and television which have nothing whatever to do with the assassination. The question is always, how much money have you made out of this? Uh, what's your political background? What's your interest, etc.? And one never gets around to discussing the facts. The 
confrontation of the Commission's conclusions and its evidence. But that is the basic question, and that is now, I think, for the first time on the agenda for the American people. And the last question I'm almost always asked is, when are you going to just quit this and do something else? And my answer has been the same now for almost three years, until such time as the American people secure that to which we are entitled, some intelligible answers from our government as to who killed our president in Dallas on November 22nd. Thank you.